In the spring of 2021, Garth Ruff, the Ohio State University Extension Beef Field Specialist, and Jared Jabarik, Feedlot Systems Extension Educator at Michigan State University, hosted a three-part webinar series on management considerations for beef sired calves from dairy cows. This third session on May 5th focused on a compilation of management considerations involved in successfully utilizing beef sires on dairy cows. In this first half of the third webinar presentation, Jared Jaborik details sire selection considerations, selecting those dairy females that should be bred to beef bulls, incorporating sex semen into the management strategy, colostrum management for the newborn, nutritional considerations from birth through the feedlot phase, and a review of the various marketing options for beef sired dairy calves. I'm Jared Jaborik, I'm a feedlot educator with Michigan State University Extension. And today is our last day of, or last program for the management considerations of crossbred dairy cattle program that we've been putting on here. Um, and today we're gonna to talk a little bit about on-farm management considerations for these crossbred dairy type cattle. And with that, let's get to it. So just a quick disclaimer, uh, all MSU extension um, programming is open to anyone. So just a quick little note there. So if you've been attending uh, our last few sessions, one of the problems that keeps popping up here is sire selection criteria, or a problem with the bulls that have been used to make these crossbred calves. Uh, and a few years ago, there was a survey done in uh, some of the upper uh, Midwest states by Halfman and Steary and 2019 publication, looking at what were some of the sire collection or sire selection criteria that dairy producers were using to make these crossbred calves. And I have them listed here. You can see the top five. 51% uh, of people were saying that semen cost was the most important sire selection criteria that they were using. Most, most likely looking for the best deal. Um, second being conception rate. Um, it's no surprise that, or the, one of the common conceptions is that um, using a beef sire on some of these uh, dairy cows that are considered trouble breeders um, is thought to improve their conception rate or their chances of becoming uh, bred. Um, third uh, was calving ease. Uh, dairy producers are looking for calving ease bulls, which is a good point. Fourth, looking for a black headed calf. And then fifth, they just let the mating service or the AI technician uh, choose which sire to use on their dairy cows. So some of the other um, selection criteria that were listed, rounding out the top 10, they had uh, marbling uh, EPD, ribeye area EPD, and then looking for sires based on frame score, or it's uh, they're letting the calf buyer choose which sires to use. And then the 10th being other factors that were not listed in the survey. So let's review some of these um, selection criteria that were commonly reported. Um, the first, most common, semen cost. And all I can say is you get what you pay for. We talked in the last session with uh, Chip uh, Kemp that what was commonly done is a these AI technicians or the mating services had a bunch of cheap Angus semen beef Angus semen in their, their tanks and they were offering it to these dairy producers at uh, a, ch a cheaper rate. And so you get what you pay for. Um, second one, conception rate. So like I said, the common I idea is that if we can use a beef bull, we can improve conception on some of these uh, troubled dairy cows. However, the recent paper in 2020 by McOrder and others demonstrated that beef sires did not offer any greater conception rate compared with Holstein sires. So in this study, they looked at a database of dairy mating, dairy cow matings, and saw that Angus sires accounted for 95% of those matings. So in this study, they looked at Angus sires and compared them to Holstein sires and really didn't see all that much of a difference with um, uh, conception rates for cows right around 
and then for heifers being closer to 54 percent but again just a big disconnect in the thought that beef sires are going to improve uh, conception rate it's going to depend on sire but the, in this study they showed no difference between um, the angus uh, sires used versus the holstein sires being used third calving ease uh, the Montawea and Berger 1997 reported that the average distosa cost for heifers was $29 and for cows was $10. In this study, um, they looked at a database and they saw that for heifers, distosa was occurring about 28% of the time and then for cows was much lower at 12%. Um, and based on these records in their study, they rated distosa scores or having difficulty scores from uh, either a one to a five based on no difficulty to extreme difficulty. And for those animals that had uh, scores of five representing extreme calving difficulty, they saw a reduction in milk production from those animals around 1,550 pounds of milk, a reduction in fat, protein. These cattle also had increased number of days open at 33 extra days, and they required additional uh, number of breeding services, and it also increased the death rate of those uh, animals giving birth. The fourth criteria here uh, is that producer, dairy producers are selecting their terminal beef sires to produce a black headed calf. Well, that's great. However, in order to meet the premiums that come with some of these black headed programs, such as the most commonly known one I would say is certified Angus beef, they actually have 10 requirements that those animals have to meet in order to even qualify for certified Angus beef. So while yes, those animals must look like an Angus and be predominantly black hided, that is not the only um, criteria that those animals have to meet or the requirement that those animals have to meet in order to certify for that certified Angus beef premium. So I have those 10 requirements listed here. You can see that in order to qualify for certified Angus beef premium, those cattle have to have at least a modest zero or greater marbling score, which would, if those are young cattle, will classify them for average choice quality grade. Those cattle also have to have medium to fine texture marbling. Those cattle have to be young, so less than 30 months of age, which would give them an A carcass maturity. Ribeye area must be 10 to 16 square inches in size. They also have to have a hot carcass weight less than 1,050 pounds. There's a fat thickness requirement as well where those cattle have to be under one inch. And these cattle must have moderately thick muscling. No hump, height greater than two inches. So that will remove uh, a lot of those uh, Brahmin influenced cattle. No capillary ruptures, which would be blood splash in the meat, and no dark cutters. So even if that calf's black kited, it has to meet these other requirements in order to qualify for the certified Angus beef premium. So just producing a black calf isn't going to cut it. Gary, you want to address that question in the Q&A. Question is, isn't there a disqualification for dairy type for CAB? So that's would fall under their moderately uh, thick muscling requirement. So long as these cattle are of adequate muscle, I would assume that they can still qualify if based on some of the questions and answers that we had with um, the uh, Larry Rose and JT Lau um, from JBS's procurement, when those cattle come across, if across the line and they're grading them, if they appear to have adequate muscle and they don't look like a Holstein, they should be able to be marketed like a native beef cattle. That's my understanding. Good question. So moving on through some of these sire selection criteria, at number five, mating services choice was the next most common. And last week, uh, Chip Kemp talked about having intentionality in your business. So if you intend on making this work, you want this uh, crossbreeding scheme to be profitable in your operation, take pride in what you're doing, put in the effort. Don't just leave it up to someone else's choice. 
we we've seen that uh, that hasn't necessarily been working out for producing these crossbreds. Um, make some informed decisions when you're selecting these sires. Next at six, seven, and eight, we had marbling score, ribeye area, and frame score. So these are all traits actually linked to um, what that sire, what that terminal beef sire has to offer. So we've talked about improving quality if we can capture. Um, value through quality grades select by selecting for mar marbling score. Also with these crossbreds, we have to remember that 50% of those genetics are coming from the Holstein dam while only 50% are coming from that terminal beef sire. So we need to select for muscling to overcome uh, the influence of that um, fine muscling coming from the Holstein breed. Again, one of the problems with uh, Holstein cattle um, when making these crossbreds is their influence of frame size. We have problem with uh, excessive carcass length possibly being an issue once those cattle reach the packing plant. And then lastly, the calf buyer's choice. Again, some of this has to do with intentionality, but um, that calf buyer also needs to be selecting these bulls for uh, based on terminal traits as well. Hopefully they have a better understanding of the traits to be looking for. Um, and we kind of covered some of those last week based on uh, calving ease, growth, and then some of your um, carcass traits and marbling and muscling of those cattle. So hopefully they're informed, but you can't just assume that they may know exactly what they're looking for. So good thing to check with them. So one of the things that's a little different between dairy and beef cattle is how EPDs are reported. So when you're looking at EPDs, they can appear a little different. So if you're not used to looking at beef EPDs, we got a few slides here to kind of walk you through what to look for or how to interpret some of these EPDs as they are different from how the dairy cattle EPDs are reported. So like I said, some of the traits that we're looking for would be calving ease, um, birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight here across the top, Actually, let me get my laser pointer. So some of those traits of importance, this is an example of the Angus breeds EPDs. Um, and for one of those traits that we're interested in are calving ease or also producing a, a lower birth weight for that calf to um, reduce our calving difficulties, but also looking at growth traits such as weaning weight, yearling weight, and then if you're interested in Holsteins, we also have an EPD for mature height of that animal. And then some of your carcass traits that you may be interested in are marbling and ribeye area. So in this case, a, high, a greater um, number for calving ease is more desired. Um, birth weight, so this is the increase in, in expressed in pounds, the sire's ability to transmit uh, birth weight to his progeny compared to that of other sires. Likewise, weaning weight and yearling weight are also in pounds compared to the average sire. Um, and then height would be in inches. Marbling is in uh, USDA marbling score. And then ribeye area would be the improvement in uh, square inches for those progeny compared to the average uh, Angus sire's progeny. Here's another example of another beef breed being uh, Simmental or Sim Angus. Um, they have EPDs for calving ease, birth weight, yearling weight, uh, weaning weight and yearling weight to give you a representation of the growth of those animals. They also have EPDs for marbling and ribeye area. And this is pretty common across uh, many of the beef breeds. They have some kind of uh, trait for calving ease, growth, and then carcass traits as well. And actually, I'm going to take a step back because I forgot to explain some of these indices. So some of these beef breeds have made uh, dollar value indices, which give you a representation of uh, profitability um, under certain situations. And the Angus Association has created these um, dairy, beef on dairy indices, one uh, for Angus on Holstein, and then also in index for Angus on jerseys. And you can see here, it's comprised of several different traits. Um, 
and some of those traits here being calving ease, growth, um, feed intake, dressing percentage, yield grade, quality grade, muscling, and height for um, the Angus Cross Holstein index. Likewise, the Simmental Association um, has done something similar, and Chip talked about this briefly last week. Um, they've created an in, in this index called Whole Sim, where they select for a few traits and they have a list of bulls that they think would be suitable or mo most suitable for crossing with Holstein cattle. So these aren't the only breeds that you should be able to consider though for your crossbred matings. Um, the U US Meat Animal Research Center puts out or conducts uh, research where they um, have a genetic base of representing a bunch of different uh, beef breeds and they feed, raise those cattle up and feed them out and they're able to um, collect this data for the birth weight, the growth, um, and they're able to see how those cattle compare to one another each year. Um, you're able to find this on the beef, this information on the beef improvement website. Um, so in this case, you'd be able to see, okay, by, based on how these cattle um, compared with one another, let's say I want the lowest birth weight. Uh, we could see, okay, uh, Angus, Red Angus, they have the lowest birth weights compared to all these different beef breeds here. Likewise, say we wanted to look at ribeye area as a indicator of muscling ability. We can scroll down through here and see, okay, which, which breeds offer uh, the greatest ribeye area. In this case, uh, looks like Bronby, Charlet, Limousine, Simmental, some of our continental beeves. So based off of this data, the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center um, creates these across breed EPD adjustment factors so that producers can compare bulls, even though the EPDs are not on the same, um, same uh, scale across breeds, we can make fair comparisons across breeds by adjusting uh, each bull's EPDs to a fair scale. So in this case, uh, they adjust everything back to the Angus sire. You can see here zeros across the board. So, Let's go through an example of what that looks like if you wanted to compare bulls from different breeds. So in this example, uh, we have two bulls, bull one being a Simmental bull and bull two being a limousine bull. So for our Simmental bull, he's got a rib, ribeye area EPD of 1.12 and then the limousine bull has a ribeye area of 1.32. We look at our adjustment factors that we can get from the previous table I just show, showed you. So here, if we scroll down, we look for our limousine, look for ribeye area 0.61. Same thing with the Simmental, looking at his ribeye area adjustment factor of 0.5. And that matches up with what we have here. So we'll take that and we'll add that to the EPD from each of those bowls. And for bull one or the Simmental bull, we get 1.62. For bull two, the limousine bull, we get 1.95. Then we can subtract that to figure out what the difference is. So offspring produced by bull number two, that's the limousine bull, in this example would have 0.33 square inch uh, larger ribeye area compared with bull one, which was a Simmental bull in this case. So this would allow for a fair comparison across uh, breeds of different bulls of different breeds. Next one of the questions that we need to answer is, which animals in our herd should we be breeding with a beef sire or to beef bulls? So this is largely gonna depend on the herd culling rate uh, within your operation or the number of replacement heifers that you need to um, fill the loss of those uh, cows that you're culling. So that's largely gonna dictate how many animals you can breed with beef semen. So for your breeding strategy, the most common one that is used in this crossbreeding system is to use female sex semen to produce your replacement heifers um, or to your genetically superior cattle within the herd or most productive cattle within the herd. 
Uh, this would typically be your heifers that you'd be breeding with this female sex semen. Think about it. They're the youngest animals coming in with the newest genetics, most superior genetics. Um, so then next, we would be breeding beef semen or conventional beef semen to the remainder of our cattle if we were able to produce enough um, replacement heifers by breeding our heifers with female sex semen. So ideally, from the beef side of th beef uh, semen side of things, we'd like to use uh, male sex semen. However, that's just not common right now in the industry, and the options that are out there offers a limited uh, number of beef sires to choose from, and those beef sires may not um, necessarily be suitable for or most desirable for making these crossbred uh, dairy beef calves. So, um, some of these. Some of the animals you may be looking at breeding with the beef semen are typically going to be um, some of your older animals. Um, as as uh, we're trying to change the genetic turnover by breeding our heifers with uh, our female sex semen. So our less productive animals or some of our older animals we'd be able to breed with the beef semen. So next. Uh, I'd like to address some of the marketing options that we have with these crossbred dairy cat, beef calves. And we touched on this a little bit last week with Chip, but I think he flew through it a little bit probably. Um, some of the options that we have, um, when we th they're probably not much different when you think about how you're marketing your uh, Holstein or your dairy uh, steer or bull calf in the, if they're young enough. Um, so, we have the option of selling a couple day old calf or maybe a week old calf, uh, typically as bull calves. Um, in this case, if we have crossbreds, you'd be selling, uh, if you use conventional semen, you would have heifers as well as bull calves. But some of the options are you're selling these calves at the auction barn. Another would be that maybe you have, uh, you've made a connection with a calf raiser or someone who has a feedlot and they have uh, someone who raises their calves and you can directly market um, those calves. That's always a great option to build those relationships that may offer um, more value for those calves, possibly uh, a premium compared to the auction barn. Um, when you send stuff to the auction barn, unless people know exactly uh, where it's coming from and they know the management practices that you're um, using on your operation, it offers a lot of unknowns with those um, people buying those calves. Um, Want to know that that calf has received adequate colostrum or been taken care of. The genetics are there for that calf to um, ultimately perform once it um, reaches the feedlot and then um, grade well once it's um, at the packing point. Another option would be to sell a wean calf. Um, typically, those calves are probably weaned um, by eight weeks old. That would give you about a 200 some pound calf. Um, Another option being selling a feeder calf. Um, those calves are usually a little bit older um, by the time that they would maybe leave that um, calf raising operation so that they're large enough and they are um, consuming enough dry feed so that they can make that transition um, to a feedlot ration. Um, another option where you can possibly cap capitalize on more value is retaining ownership and selling these, um, feeding these cattle out and selling them as fat cattle. So again, um, some people are, are doing that and they're selling them at the auction barn. Um, others are contracting them or selling them directly to the beef packing plant. And Chip even mentioned last week that um, there are feedlots that will buy these cattle um, and create truckloads um, of these cattle if you're only feeding uh, a handful of these cattle. So um, some, uh, some data reported by the Halfman and Steer uh, survey that looked at um, how, how uh, dairy operations were marketing their crossbred calves. They found that 71% of those calves were sold at a week or less of age, and then 5% at weaning, 5% as feeders, and then 20% of those operations were retaining ownership of those calves. So of those 71% calves that were sold at a week or less of age, the majority of them at 54% were being sold through the auction barn However, 29% were sold private treaty and then 8% were already contracted to feedlots.
Another important uh, on-farm decision that you need to um, consider is your colostrum management for these calves. Depending on how, even dep depending on how you plan on marketing them, it makes no difference. You need to ensure that this calf is going to receive adequate colostrum. Um, every calf on the farm deserves adequate, high-quality colostrum. We know that if those calves are not receiving it, it's going to increase uh, morbidity. It's going to increase mortality and decrease our average daily gain. So we need to ensure that those calves are receiving adequate colostrum uh, shortly after birth. So just a few quick facts to go through. Uh, what does that actually mean? What is high quality colostrum? High quality colostrum has immunoglobulin G concentration greater than 50 milligrams per milliliter. And this uh, colostrum quality is greatest immediately after that cow calves. So the longer we wait to melt that cow, uh, we're actually decreasing uh, the quality of that colostrum or the concentration of immunoglobulins is decreasing uh, with added time. So there are also uh, breed effects on colostrum quality or concentration of immunoglobulins. Um, in one paper, um, they saw that for Ayrshire, Brown, Swiss, Guernseys, Jerseys, and Holsteins, their immunoglobulin concentration was 80, 66, 63, 90, and 56. So most of you feed in or raising Holsteins out there, 56. So you can see that's right around, um, the average cow would be right around that 50 um, milligrams per milliliter. However, we have to consider that that's the average. So half of those cows are gonna be producing colostrum of adequate quality above that, and half of them are gonna be below that. So we have to consider that and make sure that that calf is getting adequate colostrum. And one of the best ways to do that is to actually ensure that we're feeding that calf compared to actually just allowing that calf to um, nurse on its own. That doesn't guarantee that that calf's consuming enough. So we uh, are actually feeding that calf. We can make sure that they're consuming enough um, colostrum so that they are receiving proper uh, uh, transfer of immunity. So it's reported that calves need a minimum of 150 grams of these immunoglobulins uh, in their first feeding so that they get adequate passive immunity transfer. So failure of this transfer is considered when the serum IgG of that calf is less than 10 milligrams per milliliter. And I'll talk about on the next slide how we can actually measure that in these calves. So when we're feeding these calves, we need to aim to feed these calves within an hour or two of birth. So when the, shortly after that calf's um, born is when that calf has the best ability to absorb those immunoglobulins. The longer we wait, that, cat, the, the, that calf's ability to absorb those immunoglobulins decreases rapidly. And by 24 hours, that calf is not absorbing uh, much at all. So, like I said, how much colostrum does that calf actually need to consume at its first feed? So, if we were to assume that we had a high quality colostrum from that cow, say 50 milligrams per milliliter of IgGs, then we would need to feed that calf approximately three, three liters or three quarts to reach that 150 uh, gram mark. However, a lot of the current recommendations are to feed four quarts. That's to hopefully ensure for some of those cows that are not producing uh, high quality colostrum at 50 milligrams per milliliter. So one of the things that you can do on farm is actually measure the colostrum quality of that milk uh, at first milking. And then you can see exactly where that cow is at, how much that calf needs to consume. Then we can also measure to see if that calf actually received enough colostrum and actually received passive immunity transfer. So there's a few tools here. We can use a handheld BRICS refractometer to analyze the total serum proteins from that calf by taking a, a blood sample. And this tool has shown a good correlation with some other laboratory testing methods. So you would be able to use this on farm and check that calf rapidly. So those calves can be, um, their serum total proteins can be measured uh, from one to 10 days old. After that, um, it loses its efficacy and doesn't really give a good reading. 
on that as far as uh, an indication of passive immunity transfer between that cow and calf. Um, and then, so another quick note is that some of these results can be influenced by dehydration. So if that calf isn't um, staying hydrated, isn't getting enough uh, milk, uh, doesn't have access to water or something like that, that can also uh, influence some of these readings a little bit. And it's important to note that while you may be measuring these, if you do see some calves that are not uh, receiving adequate colostrum, whether it's on, this is on the dairy operation, um, if you're retaining those calves, those calves may need to be on some, a, a different type of health plan or vaccination program so that these calves um, can have uh, protection as well. Um, likewise, this can, uh, measuring a passive immunity transfer can be done um, for individuals that may be buying week old calves from this auction barn or something like that. They're raising these calves on their own. This could be a method to check to see that which calves are um, indeed, indeed receive passive immunity transfer and which ones need to be managed um, differently because they don't have a uh, immune system at this time. So before I wrap up, I wanted to touch a little bit on some of the nutrition considerations. Um, first, let's talk pre-feedlot. Um, before these calves are weaned, we should be offering uh, starter intake within a couple days of birth. Uh, we wanna encourage these calves to start consuming dry feed as soon as possible. Um, we also need this starter to be nutrient dense, means that it has to have a uh, high protein value, typically a uh, 18% or greater crude protein, also a high energy um, with uh, TDN values around 80%, or if you're using net energy for gain, we'd be right around 0.6 milcals per pound. So an example of what a starter diet may look like, we could have about 50% corn. So corn would be providing a lot of the energy to this, uh, this uh, uh, feed stuff. We have a protein source. So like I said, these calves are rapidly growing. Uh, they're not consuming a lot. So we need to meet those protein requirements of that calf. So providing 20% of a protein source, this could be soybean meal, could be coming from distillers. Um, and then also a fiber source, a little bit of a filler in there. This could be soy hulls, for example. Um, and then we may have 5% molasses. This acts as a, a binder and also increases a, palatability of that feed to encourage those calves to consume more of that starter. And then also having our vitamins and minerals as, in there as well. Um, so previous research has shown that usually a textured starter is most desirable and it will increase uh, dry matter intake of those calves and result in greater uh, average daily gain compared to uh, mealed sources or finely ground or pelleted type sources. So if you can have a textured feed, which would mean that you may have a some of these other feeds, uh, say your protein and fiber source in a pellet, but you have some, uh, say whole shell corn in there, or maybe some people even put oats in their uh, starter um, that could count as some of the fiber within their starter. Add some texture that increases um, that calf's willingness to eat that. We also want to keep our feed fresh and dry. We also want to provide those calves uh, with uh, access to water at all times. So you can kind of see in the picture here, we have uh, that calf has access to a starter feed, also has access to a water source to stay hydrated. Um, and then as these calves get, start be, uh, increasing their intake a little bit, or as we start in approaching uh, weaning when these calves are going to have to rely less on their milk replacer as a nutrient source, we can start to add about 5% five, uh, uh, 5 of that diet is say chopped hay. Uh, chopped hay will offer uh, a buffer um, within that diet so that we don't have calves uh, possibly becoming um, acidotic from consuming uh, high this high solely this high energy uh, starter feed. So uh, as these calves, uh, Get a little older and we think about what we're going to feed them post weaning we need to uh, need to uh, maintain these calves on a high energy diet um, we also need to consider that as we're maybe moving these calves from different uh, um, operations maybe from 
the calf raiser to the feedlot. We need to make trans diet transitions slowly for these calves, allow them to adapt to the dietary changes. Um, as these calves are also becoming older or a little larger, they're consuming more feed, um, we can decrease the crude protein percentage in the diet over time. Um, uh, as these, uh, um, also as these cattle are um, starting to eat other feeds and we start transitioning them, uh, we may be able to actually incorporate uh, wet feed stuff. So a lot, a lot of people here in Michigan are actually feeding high moisture corn or corn silage. So those wet feeds are, um, those calves are unfamiliar with those. So we need to adjust them to them slowly. Um, likewise, like I said, we want to keep these cattle on a high energy diet to maintain that uh, growth rate of those cattle. Um, with Holsteins, if, or just cattle in general, if we feed a lower energy diet, uh, we uh, allow that animal to build up a little bit more frame. We actually slow, um, extend the growth curve of those cattle. So this figure here actually shows, that, um, shows the difference between a moderate energy diet or a high energy diet between the dash lines and the solid lines. And you can see bone growth is pretty constant over time. However, if we're feeding a high energy diet, we're actually encouraging fat deposition, which means those cattle are gonna uh, mature earlier, be finished earlier. We're also incre possibly increasing our muscle deposition, which would also help improve that muscle to bone ratio that these cattle may have. So those are some things to consider. We wanna keep those cattle on a high energy diet to keep them growing at a faster rate. So with that, that's gonna conclude my section of this talk.